Jason, can you can you see and hear me? Thanks for having me on. Ah, oh, fabulous. Good. I assume uh, I assume you are at home in LA. I am currently yes. Yeah, fantastic. And how yeah. how has that been? Yeah, the the move from have you you've been have you been there for like <laughs> a year or something like that, right? Uh, about two years. I mean, it's. I don't know why I didn't want to like it. I felt bad about liking it or something, but it's it's <laughs> undeniably nice here. And so I think we're here for quite a while. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. And so I've, for year, for decades, uh, sought to keep a, a heavy anti-LA bias. But I was there in, fe <laughs> in February, and I had to relent and admit that, yeah, it has, it has its attractions for, for sure. And um, I guess, I mean, coming from the, from, from the city of Big Shoulders, uh, there would probably be a certain bias against what might be seen to be a kind of on a soft LA sort of culture, perhaps. So listen, anyways. Yeah, like a frivolous thing. But anyway, it, it turns out like, just like anything, you find your people, you don't need that many, and, and you're good wherever you live, I think. Fantastic, listen, so. Yeah. One that you thought would would uh, would be useful to start with. I mean, even though um, I've known your story, I've been certainly since at least rework uh, have been have been sort of tracking your your, your progress in your career. Uh, I listened to I forget the the, the podcast, but it, um, uh, you kind of gave uh, a little kind of backstory on on your journey so far. Would you mind starting us off there just to kind of bring everyone onto the same page as to where you've been and, and where you are today? Yeah, sure. So. Um I kind of fell into this by accident, I guess. Um, I actually went to school for finance back in the, in the mid nineties. And then this internet thing started happening in the mid nineties. Like the first graphical browser came out in 95, 96. And I started getting into this cause I've always liked design and I liked business. I liked computers. So I started messing around and learning website design and eventually hooked up with a couple other friends back in 99 to start this company called 37 signals. We were a web design firm at the, at the start. And then um, we eventually got really busy and needed a better way to manage all the work that we were doing. We couldn't find anything that worked for us. So we ended up building our own tool, which became ultimately became Basecamp. We didn't know what was going to happen. We threw some prices on it, put it up on the, on the market. And about a year or so later, it was generating more revenue for us um, than, than our website design. So we stopped doing website design and transitioned into being a software company in about 2005. And I've been doing that ever since. We built a bunch of products, written a bunch of books, um, have a very, I'd say, unorthodox approach to business. We, we try to keep the company as small as we can. Um, we're we're self-funded. We, we don't want to take outside money. We never have. We don't want to. Um, we work remotely for about 20 years. Uh, we only do four-day work weeks in the summer. We've got a whole bunch of weird things that we do that are now, of course, becoming a bit more commonplace. But uh, we've been doing some of this stuff for a while, so happy to talk about any of those things or anything else that you find interesting. Well, I think the first thing would, I mean, for me was, um, I mean, obviously, I remember well uh, you, you know, the announcement of of moving from Thirty Seven Signals, and I remember uh, uh, you folks having obviously multiple parts in, in addition to Basecamp, and then decided to just go all in on Basecamp. And so, I guess, I mean, what was the thinking at the time as to you know uh, as as to why you wanted to do that? You know, um, we were about, I think, 30 or so people at the time, and we had four products, and um, we were only really paying decent attention to two of them mm -hmm. um, because we didn't have enough people. We didn't have enough people to, to do all the work. And then, you know, in the, in the mid-2000s, you know, the iPhone comes out, and um, now every piece of software requires multiple platforms. And then Android comes out. So you've got like, you've got to deal with the web version, the iOS version, the Android version. So every product turns into three products. And if you had four products, now you have 12 to deal with. And we just didn't have the people. So we decided to go all in on just one thing, which was our biggest hit, which was 10 times bigger than anything else we've ever built, which was Basecamp. And to, to reiterate that transition, we decided to rename the company to Basecamp mm -hmm. and sort of spin off or integrate the other products into Basecamp. And, uh, and we, we made that decision in, uh, 2014, I think it was. Yeah. And, uh, up until about two weeks ago, that's what we've been doing. <laughs> and then we, um, <laughs> a couple of years ago, we had this itch to build another product again, even though we swore off building other products, we said, we're just going to do one thing, yeah. but we had this itch to build a brand new email service, which is called Hey, H E Y.com. 
And um, we just had to do it. We felt like it was a calling almost to, to fix email. Email is this wonderful thing that had been neglected forever. We wanted to change it in a big way. And so we did that. And now we have two hits on our hands again. And so it makes sense to become a multi-product company again. And to do that, we have to lose the name Basecamp as the company name because that wouldn't be fair to Hay. So now we're back to 37 Signals, which makes Basecamp and Hay and probably other products down the road as well. Okay, cool. So probably, which means I, I assume you're working on a few things in the back burner. There's some the stuff up here okay. spinning around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so one, uh, from one of the, uh, at one of the first Thinking Digitals, we hosted a speaker named Stowe Boyd, uh, which may be a name that, that you've come across. I remember him. And yeah. he, one of the things, I mean, back in 2009, this was perhaps more revolutionary than it is today, and, and he, he liked to go around and talk about how email was broken. Uh, and and would 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 riff for as long as you would let him riff uh, as to as to the various ways that it is broken and, and why it got broken. So could you just talk to us a little bit about what the I guess the approach that you took. I mean, why? I mean, obviously it's been a problem that has been well known. Obviously, there's been various attempts to try and fix email. Uh, what what led you guys to think you know that this is something you wanted to tackle? And then I guess ultimately, what was the what was the approach you took to to try and fix it and make it better? Yeah, I would say insanity is where we started because it's kind of a sort of a ridiculous thing to try to attempt, right? Um, we're a small little company. We're going up against Google and Microsoft and Apple and I guess Yahoo and whoever else offers email. Um, but you know, we don't, we don't, we're not trying to compete with them. We're trying to offer an alternative to some who who want something different and better. So one of the fundamental problems with email is that you get emails from people you don't want. And I'm not talking about spam because spam is sort of a solved problem. But the other problem is you get emails from services you might have signed up for that you don't really want to hear from or, or, or cold emails from salespeople you don't want to hear from or, you know, your email address is no longer private. It's everywhere. And so um, the first thing that happens with Hey is when you use Hey, you get to screen your emails just like everyone screens their phone calls. Someone calls you on your phone. You don't know the number. You probably don't answer it. You let it go to voicemail. That's kind of what happens with Hey. So with Hey, the first thing you get is this thing called the screener, which the first time someone ever emails you, you get to say, do I want to hear from this person? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Like if no, I just screen them out and I will never hear from them again. Um, if I say yes, then they make their way into, into my inbox. And what's nice about that is that you begin to have control over your own time and attention and who can get in touch with you. This is the fundamental thing that needs to change about email because people are overloaded by getting too many things from people they don't want to hear about or hear from. So you start there, you begin to decide who can email you. And then I'll just, there's a million things, but I'll just pick two because I know we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> um, the other problem with email is that it's one hack after another. I'm sure everybody in the audience who uses Gmail marks emails as unread even though they've read them, so they don't forget to get back to that person later. Like that is just a terrible hack. It's not what you should be doing, but it's all email gives you. So in Hey, we have actually a feature called Reply Later, where you mark something as Reply Later. It puts it into a physical pile at the bottom of your screen. And then when you have time later in the day, you can go through that pile one after the other. They all, all open up stacked on top of each other. And you can just simply reply to those emails one after the other. And you don't have to go back to your inbox and fake something as read or unread, this whole thing. So we built these workflows in that actually relate to the way people truly want to use email. And there's like dozens of those in Hay. So that's one of the couple of the ways that make it better. And a, there's a quick pitch there. No, no, well, I asked you to, so thank you. For, Very different. For, yeah. for, for dipping, in, uh, dipping into that. So... I mean, another thing is, I mean, obviously, uh, well, there's two, before I get to my question, I was just about to ask is, I mean, it, it's interesting because you're in this uh, unusual position, possibly unique position where you're obviously running a major company servicing, you know, tons of clients uh, with, you know, various demands. And now you've added, hey, and you're, you're going to continue uh, looking at other things. And, and then you also have a kind of almost, I guess, media company with regard to, you know, the books and, and talking and, and blogging. And, um, and I guess I'm wondering if that is something that is just, you guys just naturally like being able to, you know, talk about, you know, the future of work and all the other topics that you take on? Or is it, was that like a kind of, uh, like a sort of strategy to kind of help, you know, sort of popularize your products and then like it became so popular that, you know, well, I guess we'll just keep on doing it. I'm just wondering as to kind of how that um, evolved. Yeah, truly a lot of happy accidents in, in that we don't have this deliberate strategy to 
um, market through sharing, but it turns out it's a pretty good way to do it. So we, we sort of had this idea early on that we should act more like chefs. And what does that mean? Well, chefs write cookbooks. They give away the recipes. You know, chefs aren't afraid of someone taking their recipes and opening a restaurant right next door to theirs and putting them out of business. It doesn't work that way. Like that's not how people buy cookbooks. You know, other chefs buy cookbooks to learn, to see how things are made and to have a deeper respect for the people who come up with the recipes in the first place. And then maybe when you go to that city where that chef is, you might go to the restaurant actually and taste the real food. And so we decided to, to basically share our recipes, how we do business, how we think about business, how we build products, how we hire, how we how we market, how we write, why we do the things that we do, and basically write cookbooks, which is what Rework and It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work and Remote are and Getting Real, which is another book we wrote, and Shape Up, our latest book. These are all everything we know, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that that's a really effective way to get people to understand your approach, your way of thinking. And then when they do that, they might go, gosh, they make products too? Maybe I should see what their products are like because I like the way these people think. I like the way they approach work. I'm sure they probably approach software in an interesting way. Maybe we can use their tools to build a business like they've built. And that's sort of the circular nature of it. But it's not like we don't have an editorial schedule. There's no like we must write a book every three years. There's no we must blog three days a week or video, put a video up every day. There's none of that. It's when we have something to say, we'll say it and we'll say it publicly. But that's sort of the extent of it. It just over time it adds up, and you end up having this big body of work that way. So my uh, the reason I brought that up is because obviously you published a book called Remote um, a few years back, uh, which obviously became you know it seemed uh, extraordinarily prescient given what happened with the pandemic. Uh, and I guess my question here is, I mean. You know, um, I think it was Lenin that said something about uh, sometimes, uh, you know, change takes years and sometimes year, weeks become years. Or so. I'm, I'm butchering the quote badly, but I'm sure you I think had. I know the quote, yeah. 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 And so what I, you know, I mean, obviously, so for, you know, one of the things that I, I talk about is about, you know, three years ago, I mean, literally next to nobody at least in my circles, would, you know, would, would video conference, you know, at least not regularly, right? I know places, you know, Google and things and internally, they, they would have, some cultures would have more of that than others. Uh, and then, but you know, now obviously everyone has had, you know, regularly uses uh, video conferencing and continues to do so post pandemic. And there have been other things. I guess I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, has the pandemic been a net good thing for, uh, you know, for the future of work? Um. Yeah, of course, putting aside all the, the health stuff, right? Of course. Like for work, <laughs> yeah. of course, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, it's been huge. And I think any time a myth can be busted is a good time. And just, let's call it two and a half years ago, pre-pandemic in a sense, um, there was pretty much every business felt like it couldn't work remotely. Now, of course, some can't. If you're in retail and you need customers to come to the door or restaurants, different story. But information jobs, design, consulting, software development, um, accounting, you know, all these things, these can all be done remotely. And people just felt like it couldn't be. And a lot of managers felt like they couldn't manage remotely. And I'm not suggesting that it's an easy transition for some, but it's possible. Mm. And that's where it has to begin. People have to go, you know what? This actually is possible. It's a different way of working. We need to learn how to do it. But I thought we couldn't do it at all. And now I see that we can. That is a massive amount of progress in a short period of time. And it wouldn't have happened unless it was forced upon people as it was. Because there was just so much historical momentum to say, butts in seats, got to see people working at their desk. They got to be pounding away at their keyboard. And I've got to see that happening to know that they're actually doing the work and the whole thing. And how are we going to communicate? How are we going to collaborate? How are we going to come up with ideas? Like you can do this just like we're doing this. You, you can do this remotely. It works. So this was a very important time. There's some backlash. Like it, a lot of companies didn't do it very well. And if they tried to simulate the office remotely, that doesn't work very well. Yeah. I think remote working is a fundamentally different approach to working. It's more asynchronous, less real time. It's less about throwing up a video every time you want to talk to someone and like having to have a video chat constantly all day. That's exhausting. Mm -hmm. It's more about writing things up and being more deliberate and giving people more time to themselves. And it, it's a different way of working, which we detail in the book remote. And, and our latest, uh, it doesn't have to be crazy at work is also good look at this. But yes, important time, 
big progress and I do hope it continues. And it's also, it's good for employees too. It gives them more options. People can choose to live wherever they want in the world. If their partner has to move because they got a new job somewhere else and their job has to be in person, you don't have to lose your job to move with, you know, this is good. Flexibility is a good thing. Optionality is a good thing. Yeah. I think, I mean, for me, I think, uh, especially during the, the, the height of the lockdowns and things like that, what was weird to me was how we went from never using video conferencing to now all we did was video conferencing all the time. And that, um, you know, with a, even with a large call of, say, 10 plus people, there was this oftentimes not unsubtle pressure to turn your camera on, right? And, and to be present. And it became almost like a digital presenteeism. Uh, which I found odd, you know, I mean, again, for, you know, if, if we were discussing something for the first time, then yeah, I could see, you know, the, the value of that, but it just became odd to me uh, a, 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 about that, uh, and uh, which I guess to some extent was a, was a downside of adopting this new stuff. I think the positive thing, even now that the lockdowns are over and things like that, is that people aren't having to get on in cars, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles to go to meetings that they would have totally standard had to, there would have been a lot of pressure to do it face-to-face on site somewhere. Uh, and that seems to still be enduring. And so it's, uh, it, those, those, to me, that's one of the positive things. It has been, I think, you know, anytime you can knock a commute out, that's a good thing. Um, you know, people in, in many cases are getting an hour or two back a day. And, you know, if you've got a family, I've got two young kids, you know, my wife and I and the kids, like we see each other more frequently now than, than, than we would have if we had to like spend an hour in the morning, an hour at night going to and from home and work. Like th- these are good things. There's challenges because it's isolating. And, um, you know, a lot of companies aren't good at it yet. But again, step one, it's possible. That's a big, big deal. That is a massive big, big step forward. I want to just pause for one second here. If, if there are any questions, I'll try to, I'll try to work one in uh, before, before we lose Jason uh, for time. So if you've got yep. one, please warm it up. I've got, I'm just going to continue here for a sec. So back to you, Jason. So sure. one of the things, if I remember correctly, is that uh, if I understand, is Jeff uh, Bezos uh, a, like an investor, a small investor in, in, in your firm? Yeah. So, you know, when I say we didn't take outside money, we didn't take any outside money for the business. So Jeff did buy a portion of my ownership and a portion of, of David's ownership. David's my business partner. Yeah. Um, so that, that money essentially went to us. We've never taken an outside penny to run the business. No outside money's ever come into the business. All of our uh, revenues generated from customers, from sales, and that's it. But yeah, he does own, Jeff does own a, a small piece. Uh, actually, Jeff and his wife, his ex-wife now, because... That's how that works. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> she owns she owns a piece, and he owns a piece yeah. um, of the business. Um, and then you know, David and I are the vast, vast majority owners. We also we don't have a board of directors. Um, there's no, uh, you know, the the investment is not a a power move, so that they have no control over. It's none of those sure. things. It was just like he wanted to be a little bit long for the ride, um, and, and we wanted him along for the ride. You know, especially back when we started uh, talking with him in, in 2006, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, but we, we kind of maybe catch up once every couple of years. It's not like a, yeah, it's not a well, tight the, relationship. The reason I bring it up, I guess, is I guess recently, um, I guess more of Amazon's business practices have been, have been uh, covered by the media. Things like, I guess, is it the two pizza rule in terms of, you know, you know, keeping meetings small enough that two, two pizzas would be enough to, to, to feed every in that meeting. I think the more, the, for at least for me, the more interesting one was this idea of having to craft a memo and brief before, before a meeting could be called, this thing had to be crafted and, 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 and sent. And by crafted, I, my understanding is that it's expected that up to a week is spent in actually drafting and perfecting this memo. So it becomes almost a document. And I, I just, I guess, I mean, I don't, I, I assume that you guys don't have that role. Just curious as to your thoughts about, you know, uh, that part. I can certainly see the benefit, but I can also see that clearly there might be, you know, it would be challenging for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, what, what's nice about what they do is not only do they work on crafting this memo, they all have to read it together before the meeting begins. <laughs> so to me, that's the deeper important thing, which is the, the admission that most people don't have time actually to get to prepare for things because they're busy with other stuff. So let's take a part, portion of this meeting and make sure everyone's on the same page before we begin. I, I think that's really a good idea. 
we don't really have meetings uh, at, at 37 Signals. Um, our, all of our meetings would be ad hoc between a couple people who just want to hash something out, but we don't really have these standardized. We're not a meetings culture. So we're a writing based culture. So what they do for meetings, we do constantly for everything. We pr primarily communicate through writing. Um, but I think it's a great, and I think the two pizza team rules is a smart you know, thing, assuming they still do that. Um, I like those ideas because they, they, ad they admit that we are all you know, creatures of, of, of human nature. And you know, um, keeping teams small is important because things can balloon pretty quickly. And um, making sure everyone's prepared before we talk is important because most people aren't prepared and then meetings are, are wasted time. So I, I like those ideas, even though we don't necessarily share them. Although our teams are like quarter piece, our teams are like slices. <laughs> our, our teams are typically two people yeah. uh, working on anything together. It's a maximum pretty much of two working on something together. So we, we you know, we could share a slice instead of a whole pizza. <laughs> so um I guess, you know, I mean, obviously you've been writing on this topic for a long time. Uh, I think generally speaking, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who, you know, seem to agree, uh, uh, don't seem to, they do agree. Uh, I'm sure in some cases they are able to implement some of the stuff that you've recommended. What, I mean, but you've worked across, you know, multiple businesses. Uh, it, what is it that fundamentally stops people from, from taking that approach where, whether it be about like just growth at all costs or about you know having meetings of 50 people as often as possible and you know you've heard all the obviously you've heard all the 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 the, the, the repeated complaints about corporate culture and things like that what <laughs> what well, i mean you would have you know anyways just any observation is is if there's a if there's a <laughs> meta thing that just prevents progress from happening well, I think when, when growth, which is the primary thing most companies tend to want to do, when growth is the primary goal, essentially, you get bigger and bigger and bigger, more people are involved in more things, more people need to be coordinated, more people need to be involved, you know, to, or feel like they need to be involved. And then th things just sort of balloon. And then, of course, you can't tell someone they shouldn't be involved in something. And then, you know, just kind of things get bigger and slower. Um, this is sort of just what happens. The, the growth at all costs thing, though, a lot of it comes from the end goal of a lot of companies, which many companies are being built to sell um, versus being built to stick around. You know, if you're being built to stick around, you need to focus on profits. Now, growth, growth is part of that, but profits are more important. You can grow all you want. If you lose money every year and you're still growing, like, are you really growing or are you, you going away? And that, that's my thing is like, you focus on, on making more money than you spend, keeping things in control, growing slowly and carefully over time and having a long time, time horizon. Yeah. I think that's how you do it. But if you're, if you're into this rapid growth, rapid ballooning, chasing a number, chasing a market, doing what the VC tells you, cause they need to sell the business in five years because that's how they get the, just expectations are, are whacked out. And then at that point, it's sort of like all bets are off and you just sort of throw a bunch of people at, at things and, and, and run really fast and break a bunch of stuff. And I don't, that doesn't seem like a, compelling long-term sustainable approach, but it certainly can work in three years if that's the, you know, the, the time horizon you're after. I'm gonna just pause to see if we've got any audience questions, okay? Uh, anyone, if there's anyone with questions, just go ahead and, oh, Christian. <laughs> so, You'll repeat it, or because I can't, I can't hear. Sorry, yeah, no. The question was, uh, could Jason play that guitar behind you? <laughs> Embarrassingly, barely. So I will, I will just not. I will not do that. Yes, that's 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 all right. That's fine. Uh, uh, any anybody anybody else? I thought I saw a couple. Another another hand. Is there another hand back there? No. Okay. All right. Let's just go ahead. Okay. All right. This is this is a big one. So you'll, you may want to just pick and choose, but, uh, basically, um, it's, uh, I believe from, uh, a, 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 an owner of a, a digital firm based in France. And, uh, she was, she was asking about how you keep your employees motivated and, and yeah, and, and, and I guess your, your management policies, which obviously you're not going to be able to cover all of them <laughs> in, the, in yeah, 30 seconds. I would, yeah, I would say we have a we have our, our like our, our employee handbook is public. So if you search for like it's still called the base camp, like base camp employee handbook, you can sort of read through that and look at that and get a real sense of some of the policies. 
motivation, you know, when you get talk to talk about motivation, it has to ultimately be intrinsic motivation. People have to be motivated by the work they're doing, the craft that they have, and they have to have what we do is we we protect people's time and attention. So they get a full eight hour day to themselves for the most part. And then they get to work on the things that they love to work on, which is their craft. What people, what, what demotivates people is when they like to work on stuff, they don't get to work on it because they're stuck in meetings all day and pulled off this and pulled off that and, and pulled between things that they don't want to do. And then they find out they have no time except 20 minutes here and 15 minutes there. Then they're working at night and working in the weekends and working early morning because no one's around. And that's the only time they don't get bothered. It's like, that's what kills people's motivation. So just hire great people who love the craft, love the work that they're doing and let them do the work, give them great work, give them the time or well, not even give, don't take the time um, and hire other wonderful people that they want to work with and build products that customers care about. It's like this, I know I'm, it's sort of like almost trite. I feel like when I'm saying this, it's like, of course, but it is kind of, of course, I think a lot of companies don't look at the, of course, and they don't see what they're doing. And then you end up with situations where, you know, people leave after a year or two. Like we, we you know, most of our employees stick with us for five, six, seven, eight, plus years you know it's just that's the kind of environment we have um for the most part let me let me ask uh let me ask uh, uh one more question related to that which is um we we've had a couple talks today covering uh, well one in particular covering social media and 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 how it polarizes uh and uh and 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 he brought a lot of data in, in with regard to uh discussing that issue and um you know it's it's obviously something that's that's very toxic in modern life, uh, both here in the UK as well as obviously in America as well. And obviously, uh, you guys instituted a policy to you know to stop that sort of political talk within the workplace. Which to me, when you announced it, I thought that that sounds quite reasonable. Obviously, there was a stronger reaction to that. And I guess not so much to describe what happened, but more um, about like ultimately what you learned from from that incident. Yeah. So this is a little bit more of a US centric thing. Um, over the past few years, there's just been a lot of, I mean, in the United States for mm, eight plus years, it's been kind of difficult politically, I think. Um, sure. It's very become very tribal. Social media has definitely in, inflamed that. And um, it was becoming hard for certain people to work with other people because of the assumptions that some people made about other people's point of view politically or socially or whatever. And it just, it, 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 it got to a place where we, we couldn't, we couldn't function without having all these political discussions about everything. And it, it just, it wasn't healthy. Yeah. Um, and so we decided, you know, we're not going to talk politics at work in our work systems. So in, in base camp itself, which is where we do all of our work and manage our projects and communicate company wide. If people want to talk politics privately amongst themselves, they can totally do that. That's of course fine. That's not my business, but we can't keep infusing this in every discussion or enough discussions where it's like, then it just doesn't work. So we decided to do that and made a, made an announcement about a year, a little over a year ago. And it was very uh, contentious and a number of people left the company. Um, and we were, we were villains on, on Twitter for a while and, and, and social media and the whole thing. And, and that, I get it. That's just what that world is like. And, and we moved on we hired new people and we're in a much, much, much better place today. Um, we're focused on the work again. We're focused on building products again. Mm -hmm. People who want to focus on politics and societal issues, totally fine. And there's plenty of places where you can go do that. We're not one of those places. And luckily there's a million different places to work. And especially with remote work, there's more opportunities for more people these days. And I think that's what, what's great about small companies, especially is that you can experiment. Okay. And we see our company as an experiment. And uh, this is our experiment and what we've been doing for, for 23 years. And we'll hopefully have another 20 years to go doing it our way. And putting the chips on the table and saying, here's what's important to us. And if you are with us on that, come work here. If not, that's fine as well. So that was sort of the, um, the decision we made. So you stuck to, you Remember, I have to run in like one I, minute. I'm going to so literally you know. so let you go thing. right now. In fact, I will let Great. you go right now. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a huge privilege and a pleasure. And, and thank you for your time. Likewise. And this is you, great. Jason. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Take care.